Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today's podcast is brought to you by Indiana University Press. Their Life of the Past series is lavishly illustrated and meticulously documented to showcase the latest findings and most compelling interpretations in the ever-changing field of paleontology. Find their books at iupress.indiana.edu. This week, in our 217th episode, we have an interview with Dr. Thomas R. Holtz Jr. of Tyrannosaur and other dinosaur fame. We also have Dinosaur of the Day, Nanosaurus, and as always, a bunch of news, including the first new dinosaur of 2019, depending on how you determine what year a dinosaur is from. But more on that later. <laughs> <laughs> but before we get into all that, we want to thank some of our patrons. And this week, we'd like to thank Chris, Nicholas, Trent Carbajal, Stefan, Nutmeg, Taya, Dashiell Hammond, Stego Sophie, Lalin, Ayumi, Paul Acanthus, Lydia, Kentish, and Jackson Crawford. We don't have any new patrons this week, but now would be an excellent time to join because we just launched our Discord server. So for all patrons, when you join, you can just click a button in Patreon to link Patreon to your Discord account, and then you get access to a place to request Dinosaur of the Days and see what else has been requested. You can chat about dinosaurs with us. I posted right before we started recording this episode that we're doing that and giving a little bit of behind the scenes information. And we'll be adding more channels too in the future, depending on what people start talking about or asking for. So make sure to head over to patreon.com slash I know dino and check that out. Jumping into the news... The new dinosaur that I was just hinting at is called a Dinomosaurus or a Dinomosaurus arcanus, and it was published by Albert Prieto Marquez and others. He publishes a lot of new dinosaurs, it seems like. Mm -hmm. It's a new Lambiosaur dinosaur. It is not to be confused with Dynamosaurus, even though they have very similar names. <laughs> When I was saying at the beginning of the episode that it might be the first one of 2019 or it might be from 2018, it just depends on how you determine what year something was described in because it was published online in 2018, but it's going to be published in print in April of 2019. So it's been listed in both places as a new dinosaur of 2019 and 2018 because doing the study on this takes several years and then it takes a little while to publish. So it can be confusing, but... Its full name, like I said, is A. Dynamosaurus arcanus, and A. Dynamosaurus is Greek for weak shoulder lizard. <laughs> yeah. Which is maybe the worst, like, meaning of a dinosaur name that I've heard. I don't know if it's the worst, but it's not great. Yeah, naming something after its weak shoulders, pretty harsh. But they didn't find much else, right? <laughs> yeah, that was, like, the most unique thing about the dinosaur, which I think is why they picked it. But, yeah. It's sad with his weak shoulders. And then Arcanus comes from the word for secret because basically it's hard to figure out how to classify hadrosaurs from the area because you don't get enough remains and you don't find them all that often. You go by the shoulders. In this case, yeah. <laughs> so it's a hadrosaur, specifically a lambiosaurine hadrosaur. And the most famous lambiosaurines are probably Parasaurolophus and Corythosaurus, both have very interesting head crest situations, but this isn't thought to be closely related to either of them based on the bones that we found. And we didn't find the top of its head, so we can't find out if it has like a cool crest or one of those big old trombone like trumpety things sticking out the back like Parasaurolophus. So we're kind of missing a lot of it. We're left with its weak shoulder, basically. <laughs> Generally, hadrosaurs have pretty strong shoulders being that they're often kind of quadrupedal, you know, you need to support some weight, you need strong shoulders. But this one has a relatively narrow shoulder blade, and they call it shallow, so it doesn't really stick that far back where you'd expect it to. And that means there's not as much space for muscle attachment, and therefore it had quote-unquote weak shoulders. I mean, it's probably a lot stronger than our shoulders, but weaker relative to its closest relatives. Sometimes you're just made to be prey. That's pretty harsh. <laughs> is it as harsh as the name? I guess. I don't know. Maybe it was more bipedal. This was mostly just a description of the animal itself and not a lot of speculation about its behavior. So if it's more bipedal, maybe then it has weaker shoulders because it doesn't need all that muscle. 
I don't know. We'll find out later, maybe. <laughs> but we might have to find more fossils of this guy, which could be hard. If you're wondering what exactly in the shoulder was weak, because that's kind of vague, specifically they think it had a weaker deltoid, which is the same muscle we have on the top of our arm. It's a popular one to work out, because if you make it bigger, it makes your arm look big and strong. <laughs> and then also the subscapularis, which is not a muscle that people other than probably bodybuilders know about and try to work out specifically because it's a fan-shaped muscle that's kind of in your back. So if you like give yourself a pat on the back, you're kind of touching it, but it's also, I don't think on top, it's the, it has sub in the name because it's kind of underneath. So it's pretty obscure muscle, but it's really important for your shoulder. So, so kind of secret? Kind of, to yeah. To go with the... <laughs> Species name. Yeah, it has a secret that its muscles are, are weak. <laughs> <laughs> it was found in Catalonia, Spain, near Andorra. First, I was thinking that whole adinomo was part of like Andorra at some point, but it obviously doesn't have anything to do with that. It's about a shoulder. It's from the same basin as another Lambiosaurine called Parahabdodon, which I think we've talked about before. And they look like they're probably close relatives. In fact, there is a chance that they might get synonymized in the future because they're pretty similar. But this is only the fifth hadrosaurid that's been found in Europe, according to the authors, hmm. which seems really low. I'm surprised that there have been so few. But it did go through peer review, so I believe them. That's the kind of thing where someone would read this and say, I discovered a hadrosaur in Europe, and I know there's more than five. So it's probably a fair point. The holotype only consists of the nearly complete left scapula that, you know, gave it its name and everything. They also found vertebrae, part of its jaw, a partial rib, parts of its legs, arms, hips, and two small foot bones. But they didn't include any of that in the holotype because there was a duplicate bone. They actually found two left tibiae, meaning that obviously no animal has two left tibiae. You know, it would have to have like three legs for that to happen. And therefore, we know there's at least two individuals in this jumbling up pile of bones. Hmm. So they can't just say like, oh, all of these belong to the same animal because they, they can't, right? Like at least one bone is from a different animal. So then it opens up the possibility, well, maybe it was three animals or who knows what. So yeah, they can only use one bone as the holotype and that's that weak shoulder bone. Makes sense, then, if that's the holotype bone, that's the name. Yeah, because there isn't really anything else interesting about that bone. It's from the upper lower Maastrichtian, as they call it, which I really have to think about that for a second. So it's mostly the lower Maastrichtian, but then it's the upper end of it, which I think makes it about 70 million years old, maybe a little bit younger. I don't know. Maastrichtian isn't that long. It's only 72 to 66 million years, somewhere in that period. It's pretty late for a dinosaur, obviously, because the Maastrichtian is the very end of the Cretaceous, and after the Maastrichtian, no more non-avian dinosaurs. But actually, it's earlier than average for European Lambiosaurine hadrosaurs, they say. But I don't know how many there have been discovered, because there's only five hadrosaurids. So how many Lambiosaurines can there be? Like, maybe two others? <laughs> The authors say that this find supports the notion that Lambiosaurian hadrosaurs came to the, quote, ibero armorican island during the Maastrichtian, end quote. And I hadn't heard of the ibero armorican island before, but you can guess where it is based on where it was found in <laughs> northern Spain. So ibero refers to the Iberian Peninsula, which is present-day Spain, Portugal, a little bit of France, Andorra, and Gibraltar. So that little chunk of Europe that sticks down by Africa. And then Armorica includes the Armorican Massif, which is northwest France. If you look at a map and you see that like weird part of France that sticks out into the Atlantic Ocean, that actually used to be attached to Gondwana like 500 million years ago, mm -hmm. and then w made its way up to Europe. And it's pretty geologically different than the rest of France, but not in the terms of dinosaurs because it was there by the time dinosaurs were around. It's kind of weird to me, though, because they call it the Ibero-Armorican Island, like it was the same island at the time when this dinosaur was discovered. But during the Cretaceous, the middle part should have been underwater, so they really should have been separate islands. I'm not really sure why they call it the same island. Maybe they're close enough together that they think animals could easily get back and forth, more so than getting to Africa or other parts of Europe. I'm not sure. 
But in any event, we know a little bit more about what was on this little island in Europe way back in the day. Yep, pretty cool. In some other news, we have an interesting story from Valley City, North Dakota about Bob the Triceratops. So Bob was once displayed at the Barnes County Historical Society, and this Triceratops was found in 2003 on Craig and Bobby Eglin's ranch, and Bob is named after Bobby, my guest, and Bob's from the Hell Creek Formation. About 90% of the bones were found, and the Triceratops is about 26 feet long, or 7.9 meters. And then in 2016, Bob was sent to a commercial fossil cellar in Arizona, and supposedly a buyer in the United Arab Emirates was going to buy him, and the asking price was $1.4 million. It doesn't sound like that worked out. Bob was instead almost sold to a doctor in South Korea, but then Korean authorities, quote, frowned on his plans for the dinosaur. Interesting. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't couldn't find too many details, but Bob is up for sale again. Meanwhile, there's another Triceratops that's been found in Bowman County, probably bigger than Bob, and this one might be called Willard, though the final naming rights go to the owner of the property where the Triceratops was found. Interesting. 90% complete is amazing. Mm -hmm. That'd be quite the Triceratops specimen. It might be one of the most complete ones ever discovered. Kind of a shame if it went into a private collection somewhere and no one got to see it. Yeah. So I, I don't know. Sounds like Wherever Bob goes, it'll be an expensive buy. Yeah. I mean, in South Korea, they said that it was going to be sold to, what, a dentist? Is that what it was? A doctor. Yeah. So, I mean, maybe he was going to put it in the doctor office. That would have been cool. There's room. <laughs> Quite a large display. Squeeze it into the atrium. It would make going to the doctor more exciting for kids. Even the Barnes County Historical Society had trouble fitting in Bob, and they have a smaller Triceratops now. It's a cast of one. And they said that it fits much better. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. In Mongolia, there were two men who were arrested trying to sell a dinosaur fossil. They had posted information about it on Facebook. That one's currently under investigation, so there's not much other information about it yet. But that, I think, shows how complicated these things are and how the rules are different depending where you are, Mongolia versus the U.S., where they're allowed to sell these versus Mongolia. You can't. I don't think you can sell them at all in Mongolia. You definitely can't take them out of the country. Mm -hmm. I know that much. But yeah, I think they're all property of the state in Mongolia, kind of like parts of Canada. If you find it, you're supposed to notify the authorities and then professionals come out and excavate it and put yeah. it in a museum kind of thing. And in the U.S., it depends on the land and the mm -hmm. permits and a whole bunch of other stuff. What state you're in. Yep. In museum news, the University of Oregon's Museum of Natural and Cultural History has a new exhibit called Dinosaurs Take Flight, the Art of Archaeopteryx. It opened on January 19th. There's original paleo art, real fossils, hands-on activities, and it's a traveling exhibit, so it'll be there until May 19th for anyone in the area. In New York, the American Museum of Natural History has a new exhibit called T-Rex, the Ultimate Predator, which will be opening on March 11th this year. This exhibit... You might guess. It's all about tyrannosaurs. There's an emphasis on T-Rex. <laughs> it answers questions like, how did T-Rex evolve? How did T-Rex grow so quickly? Why was it such an efficient killer? And there's going to be some interactive things like how T-Rex roared. You get to, I think, play around with different animal sounds. Oh, interesting. And there's video projections, fossils and casts, and life-size reconstructions, including one of an adult T-Rex with patches of feathers. The museum is also working with Vive, HTC Vive. They're going to have an interactive multiplayer VR experience where people build a T-Rex skeleton together and then they see it come to life. Oof. Yeah. That'd be intense. Yeah. I wonder exactly how that would work because even in VR, your arms aren't long enough to reach up high enough to like put together the skull maybe, unless you're doing it on the ground or something. Could be on the ground. Maybe there's a way to kind of point in the right direction or something. Or you're a giant. Yeah. I imagine it's not too complicated if it's something that a group of people can do while visiting a museum. Yeah, that's true. It might be like the entire head and then you like point at it and so the head goes there. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds really interesting. I'm sure that'll be massively popular. Yeah. Everybody loves T-Rex and they've got a pretty good exhibit space there too for special exhibits. But also, speaking of other interactive experiences, the Natural History Museum in London, they've teamed up with multiple organizations to create a, they're calling it a new type of experience, 
where, quote, visitors will be able to experience multi-sensory worlds, play detective roles, and meet a cast of digital characters, including androids, artificial intelligences, velociraptors, and fossils, end quote. So they're working with the Science Museum next door. There's going to be animated dinosaurs at the Natural History Museum, and then visitors can go next door and play detective at the Science hmm. Museum with the androids. <laughs> the exhibits are, they're going to open it around mid-2020. That sounds cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think both of those museums are free, too. We only went into the Natural History Museum. They have, like, a suggested donation, but it's much more suggested than the American Museum of Natural History. They don't make it seem like you have to pay to get into it. True. <laughs> it's very much like a, hey, it's free, but if you want to give us a few pounds, you can do it here. Or any currency. In some other news, I recently came across My Fossil, their new app, that allows you to upload fossil images if you're in the field to compare and discuss findings and techniques. And you can add your fossil to the fossil gallery with details about location, taxonomy, and geology. And it's researchers all over the world can access. And you can also create social groups to interact with. So this could be really good for people. We often get questions, people sending us pictures of fossils, and they want to know what it is, and we don't have the eye for it. But here's another <laughs> resource for you. Yeah, that's true. Next, thanks to Jeremy who shared this one with us. So Tri-C, which is a community college in Cleveland, Ohio, has a new Triceratops logo. We might have talked about it when they were when they first decided to make Triceratops their new logo, but the logo is out. It looks pretty cool. The color's teal. It looks pretty powerful, like it's about to charge, which I guess was a concern that it wouldn't look intimidating enough <laughs> as a Given its color. Yeah. No, not just the color, just because it's an herbivore, I guess. Oh, uh, okay, yeah. Yeah, a lot of times they take herbivores, if you have an herbivorous mascot, and they give them like a big like scowl and like those big slanty eyes and everything. They got to make them look all intense. I think the horns should be enough, though. Yeah, the horns help. <laughs> <laughs> and last, thanks to Brian and Ian from Patreon who shared this one with us. So The Atlantic has this fun gallery of, quote, dinosaur statues of questionable accuracy. <laughs> which includes, quote, an aging version of a dinosaur at Dinosaur Land in White Post, Virginia, which, looking at the picture, it looks like a very rusty theropod of some sort. I can't tell what kind. There's also a couple of really colorful dinosaurs, T-Rex and Triceratops, that are standing off at Lunetta Park in Manila. There's Dolores, a 47-foot sauropod statue that's shown eating a woman. This photo is actually from 1931, and it says that it's part of a stage show at the Roxy Theater, and it snorted fire. <laughs> wow, that's some pretty good work for 1931. Yeah. Also, I think sauropods were shown as more carnivorous in the 30s and oh, earlier. Oh, very true, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's also a very dragon-like T-Rex at a dinosaur park in Thailand. The Bayville dinosaur is included. The photo's from 1984. It still has its head, but it looks like it could use some refurbishing. <laughs> that one keeps luckily going up. now it has, yeah. <laughs> There's a couple dinosaur skeletons that made an appearance at the closing ceremony of the Salt Lake City Winter Olympics in 2002. I don't remember that, but looks cool. There's a fallen down T-Rex model that's got graffiti on it from an abandoned amusement park in Berlin. There's also Iggy from the Crystal Palace Dinosaurs, but if you've seen our YouTube video, because we got to visit the Crystal Palace Dinosaurs when we were in the UK a few months ago, Iggy was technically scientifically accurate when he was made. Yep. Yeah, there's a big difference between making like a dragon T-Rex in the late 20th century and making a, <laughs> a more like quadrupedal reptile-like dinosaur in the mid-19th century. Yeah. I'd say so. <laughs> <laughs> but still a fun gallery to peruse through. Before we get into our interview with Dr. Tom Holtz, we have a word from our sponsor, Indiana University Press. As Garrett mentioned at the beginning of the show, they have the Life of the Past series, which has a lot of great illustrations and information to showcase the latest findings and most compelling interpretations in paleontology. And so I'd like to highlight one of the books in the series, which is called Turtles as Hopeful Monsters. Where do turtles hail from? Why and how did they acquire shells? These questions have spurred heated debate and intense research for more than 200 years, brilliantly weaving evidence from the latest paleontological discoveries with an accessible, incisive look at different theories of biological evolution and their proponents. Turtles as Hopeful Monsters tells the fascinating evolutionary story of the shelled reptiles. 
paleontologist Oliver Rappel traces the evolution of turtles from over 220 million years ago, examining closely the relationship of turtles to other reptiles and chartering the development of the shell. Turtle issues fuel a debate between proponents of gradual evolutionary change and authors favoring change through bursts and leaps of macromutation. The first book-length popular history of its type, this indispensable resource is an engaging read for all those fascinated by this ubiquitous and uniquely shaped reptile. Yeah, turtles are really fascinating because basically their armor is their rib cage, sort of how they evolved, and then they're kind of just like mush in between it. Yeah, they can feel everything on the shell. Yeah, it's like they turned almost like taking a internal skeleton and turning it partially into an exoskeleton. It's such a weird transition. I can't think of any other animals that are like that. There are animals that have sort of armor outside their body, like an armadillo or something, and then you've got all the stuff with exoskeletons like trilobites, but this weird combination where it's like it definitely has an internal skeleton, but then it just kind of like pushed its ribs out and tucked everything else inside it to give it some protection is so strange. We still don't know exactly how it happened, but at least this book can give you some information yeah. <laughs> if you're interested in finding out like what early turtles looked like and how that happened. And they've been around a long time. They were around during when non-avian dinosaurs were alive too. Yeah, there's still a question of where exactly turtles fit into the family tree. So it's definitely worth checking out. Yeah, so if you want to learn more, go to iupress.indiana.edu. And now we're going to get into our interview with Tom Holtz. But if you're a premium patron member, you might want to listen to the unabridged <laughs> version, which is on the premium content feed on your custom RSS feed, because we got into a lot of stuff. It, the interview took almost an hour. It's going to be a little bit less than that once we trim out some of the pauses and things like that, but still too long to fit into the regular episode. So definitely check that out if you're interested in hearing more. Yeah, it was a great discussion. It was. He's done so much with dinosaurs. If you have any of the major dinosaur encyclopedia type books, you know just how thoroughly involved in dinosaur paleontology he is. <laughs> so we were really happy to talk to him. Today, we have the pleasure of talking to Dr. Thomas R. Holtz, Jr., who is a principal lecturer at the University of Maryland's Department of Geology and also the faculty director of the Science and Global Change Program. And Tom's research interests include phylogeny and functional morphology of theropods, especially tyrannosaurids, ecomorphology of terrestrial predators, and mesozoic biogeography. He's written a number of books, including Dinosaurs, the most complete up-to-date encyclopedia for dinosaur lovers of all ages, and Jurassic World Dinosaur Field Guide, and he's involved as a consultant and on-air talent for documentaries, including Walking with Dinosaurs, When Dinosaurs Roamed America, and Jurassic Fight Club. Did I get it all? That's all right, yep. <laughs> There's definitely more. There's but. definitely yeah. more, but... <laughs> I should also add, uh, because I'm supposed to do this, I realize I am also a research associate at the Department of Paleobiology at the National Museum of Natural History. That's the Smithsonian. Mm. Now, ever since I've become a research associate there, part of their rules are you're supposed to include that as one of your uh, credentials. Okay. So, nice. um, so yeah, that's one. Uh, I'm also on the scientific committee for the Maryland Academy of Sciences, which sounds really impressive, but in this day and age, uh, it mostly runs the Maryland Science Center, which is a kid-oriented museum in downtown Baltimore. And while the Smithsonian main dinosaur halls are closed, it's probably the largest concentration of dinosaur skeletons, mostly casts, in the Baltimore-Washington area. So, <laughs> Oh, cool. Awesome. Right. But in June, that will change as the Smithsonian <laughs> reopens their uh, dinosaur hall. So. <laughs> I think we should also mention you consult on the, the science fiction books in your uh, a character in a story. Oh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Well, thanks for joining us today. <laughs> yeah. So right off the bat, I want to thank you for writing the Dinosaur Encyclopedia because we use it all the time. And I want to know how you figured out all these pronunciations of different <laughs> dinosaurs. Sure. I uh, Sometimes they... On a, on a rare occasion, people actually include a pronunciation in their paper. Yeah. Um, and so that one, that makes it easy. The other ones are either mostly by what I've heard other people say, and in particular, if I know what the, if the person who named it, what, how they pronounce it. Mm -hmm. And then other ones, I just try to follow the 
the rules or the, the standards of pronunciation by, and being an American, I use the American paleontologists. And that, that can be important because, you know, we over here say ceratopsia, but there are some sticklers, and primarily in the UK, who will say keratopsia mm -hmm. or even keratopia, because technically speaking, Marsh should have dropped that S in there mm -hmm. when he named uh, uh, ceratopsia. It should have been uh, keratopia. But um, yeah, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> it's triceratops and it's ceratopsia, so. Okay, that's good. That's exactly the order I go into. First, I look at the paper, and then if I can't find that, I try to find an interview with the person who discovered it. And then right. otherwise, you just try to piece it together from the words it's based on. Well, then you go to Tom's book. Oh, yeah, I go to your book. Well, exactly, yeah. <laughs> but those, the new discoveries aren't in there, unfortunately. <laughs> no, not yet, at least. Uh, in some cases, you know, I try to use where, where the pronunciation by the creator might be a little odd um, in terms of uh, American pronunciations. For example, I don't call it Giganotosaurus, which uh, uh, Rudolfo Coria would say. <laughs> it's her Argentine pronunciation. It's Giganotosaurus. So that, that would be the way that, that most American paleontologists would say it, rather than Giganotosaurus. <laughs> <laughs> that's true, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's the most difficult thing when you start combining like Spanish with Latin. It's like, where do it's you... <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Cool. So you just sort of hinted at it. Are you going to release a second edition of this book? Yes, there will be. Um, there will be a second edition sometime in the future. I haven't actually started on it yet. I am in the midst, and I pr I'm promising my editor online right now, as I say this, that I will finish all uh, the revisions of the chapters, all the chapters of a book, uh, a younger kids' book on T Rex first for Random House uh, that I've been working on for more years than I should have been. <laughs> Once that's done, then I go back to do revisions of Dinosaurs, the now increasingly out-of-date guide <laughs> for dinosaur lovers of all ages. But yes, I, there definitely are plans to update that. Some of the changes, and this is a scoop here, I will probably not include the sidebars with the other paleontologists in the second edition, so that will make the first edition a, a more of a collector's item. Mm. And the reason for that is that gets me uh, a bunch of new pages available <laughs> because in the publishing world, they want to simultaneously, yes, update everything you can, but change as little as possible. Uh, because on, <laughs> on the one hand, obviously you want the new up-to-date new information, but on the other hand, if you can keep the spacing and organization as close to the original that requires less cost ultimately in terms of people who are involved in moving the figures around and moving the columns and the spacing and so forth. Mm -hmm. So that sidebars with the other researchers will probably disappear, but there'll be new content. So that will be good. Cool. And so we'll be able to have the new look of Dinochirus in there and, um, say something more about mega raptorins and maybe by the time i get to writing that we'll know where the heck they go um <laughs> although i'm not holding my breath and you know the the big all the various big reorganizations that have been going on in in some clades so that'll be good and there'll have to be a batch of new art for some of it as we've learned new things about the appearances so yeah cool so you mentioned dinochirus and mm -hmm. I, I saw that you you wrote a couple of articles about his big crazy arms. Is that one of your like favorite dinosaurs? I, I just love that guy. <laughs> oh yeah! In fact, I had heard rumors in the years before the paper came out that um, Phil Curry and colleagues had new specimens, and I had even seen photographs of the skull in advance, uh, but not close up and not detailed. And then I went to the SVP meeting where Phil Curry presented it. It's like, oh my God, this is so wonderful because, I mean, it's it's been a mystery dinosaur like almost literally my entire life. It was <laughs> discovered the same year I was born. Uh, it was first published when I was a very small kid. So it began when I was getting, for me, what were the brand new dinosaur books. <laughs> so it was coming out during, you know, when I was a kid. They would include, you know, here's this mystery dinosaur known only from these giant arms, like cool, awesome, amazing. And then so Phil Curry presents this, this new reconstruction with the new information and all of our jaws are on the floor. It's like, oh, my God, it's weird. Um, <laughs> and so when I got the solicitation from Nature to be one of the reviewers for the paper, it's like, yeah, twist my arm. You know, I responded <laughs> 
right away. And I will, I will admit, that is the fastest turnaround I have ever done as a peer reviewer. I got it back <laughs> to them within 24 hours. Wow. <laughs> Uh, I don't want to necessarily admit to the public that I can do that because then maybe <laughs> other editors will, will hold me to that. This is an extraordinary case because basically I argued in there, we've waited long enough. The public <laughs> has waited long enough. We need to have this information out there. And so they asked me to write the accompanying reflection about it. I managed to get there with the the really cool um, art that accompanied it. So Yeah, it's great. I loved, my favorite thing about it was how wrong everyone's guess was about what these arms would be attached to you know huge claws big powerful arms and then it ends up being this like humpbacked weirdo (laughs) (laughs) exactly you know sort of the 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 naive approach was that it was some sort of generalized carnivorous dinosaur and there's some some old art that shows that and but there were people like ostrom who realized ah no these have all the attributes of an ornithomimosaur only they're gigantic and so you know, the, the more informed view was that it was a giant ornithomimosaur, but we tended to think that it was just an ordinary, like a struthiomimus or gallimimus on steroids, mm. which is strange enough. I and mean, that's how it shows up, for instance, in Dinotopia in, uh, in James Gurney's art. But then we see the actual thing, and it's got a pseudo, you know, a pseudo hadrosaur skull. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's got this humpback. It's got this beer belly. It's got... Uh, relatively short and stocky legs, which we kind of expected, but the the unguals, the actual toe bone, the final toe bone, claw bone, are like squared off at the end, <laughs> and that's not erosion. That's the actual bone. It's so what those hooves look like. It's hard to say. They're they're not at all like the more tapering ostrich like hooves or uh, claws of of typical ornithomimosaur. So they're just weird, and they're lovely weird. I mean, that's the sort of thing you know. That's what attracts, I think, most people to paleontology is animals that were real, but were very different than the things we see today. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Speaking of that, and specifically arms, so we kind of all know about how T-Rex arms got shorter to deal with the huge head, but do you have any thoughts on like why Alvarosaur arms got so small? Yeah, that is a, that's a real puzzle. I mean, <laughs> because it's clear, unlike... Tyrannosaur arms, which are under muscled for their size. I mean, yeah, they're stronger than your arms or my arms, but that's not saying much when we're talking <laughs> about an eight ton animal. But alvarosaurs are clearly heavily muscled for their size. They have this ginormous uh, delta pectoral crest, they have this really big uh, alacronon process, and they've got the longest, the largest funny bone of any dinosaur. <laughs> so all the levers in the arm are showing that they're very strong, but they're so dinky. (laughs) So the best I think anyone has come up with is that they are for piercing and breaking into some form of insect nest. But in order for that to work, they basically have to get their chest up against it and then batter, boom, 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 up against it and then back off and then peck at it with their, their sort of beaky snout, mm-hmm. which, in fact, you know, that, that long and more slender beaky snout is something that can extend into a smashed hole better than a, a more typical theropod uh, snout would be. Now, there was a, a joke idea that we had back in the 90s when these guys were first being found. There is a specimen of one of the Mongolian ankylosaurids that has a puncture wound on its skull. <laughs> and it's thought that the puncture wound is still cool because the puncture wound is probably a Tarbosaurus bite. Mm-hmm. But the joke was, no, no, Alvarosaurus were actually specialized ankylosaur hunters. <laughs> and so they would leap on the top of the skulls, and go wham, 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 <laughs> the armor, and then peck out the brain. Because apparently, although they're not very big, they were good eaten. <laughs> oh, man, that's a really good one. <laughs> I just had a like an image of Woody the woodpecker kind of thing. The wham yeah. wham wham. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the predatory woodpecker. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's really funny. So another weird arm that I wanted to ask you about is uh Carnotaurus, because that also kind of has, you know, yeah. really large bones that you wouldn't expect, you know, hidden beneath. It's got like that huge scapula. Do you right. any thoughts on that one? Yeah, my suspicion is that the the really big scapula coracoid of Abelisaurs and also their cousins, the Noasaurids, 
may have something more to do with neck muscle attachment than the arms themselves, because some of the neck muscles do attach uh, along the front of that surface. Mm. And at least in the case of a belly source, they have the, that really thick neck. It's sort of underappreciated. The medial lateral, the, the, the width of the neck is, is quite, quite large. And so they probably had very powerful bites, at least using the neck part of it. And so the scapula coracoid may be part of that complex. Also, they've got, they seem to have a lot of mobility of that, the humerus, uh, although what the heck they were doing with it, I don't <laughs> know, spinning it around like tiny propellers. No, not, not quite that good, but um, uh, because the front end of it, yes, seriously, what what are they thinking about? You know, it's, um, you know, where your, your forearm has basically become part of your wrist um, <laughs> and your hands are, you know, really, the, the fingers are really shortened up, I, truly bizarre. And what's beginning to come out is that it's not just the big predatory abelisaurs that are like that. There is a, a noasaur, so the small cousins of the abelisaurs from Niger um, that Paul Serino's team have been working on for a while. And it was it hasn't been named yet, but it has been shown on display at some exhibits. Unfortunately, um, not in Chicago yet, to my knowledge, uh, but it was in Japan, among other places. And it, too, has these tiny little arms that really can't reach far beyond its chest. So what the heck it's doing with them is really hard to say. And, and one of the thoughts that they had, maybe they could be used in that one to sort of dig out spaces. But uh, doing what? It's hard to say. So, uh, <laughs> you know, what one default position that people will throw out is display. So, you know, you can still move it around. And there are plenty of animals that use forelimbs for display and you know, not just birds, but also lizards. I mean, beardies, bearded dragons will wave at each other and so forth. So <laughs> maybe maybe they still had a function in that context. But I, there, as you said, there's a lot of muscle in there for not much action or for not much uh, power, <laughs> at least coming off of those. So nature is weird. Yeah. <laughs> Would they be at all useful, do you think, for like helping them get up if they fell down? I don't even think they could probably get enough leverage doing that. Yeah. <laughs> Let's put on those the chest muscles. I don't think that those arms could maybe do much contact with the ground <laughs> if the chest is on the ground. It's similar, similar to Tyrannosaurus. And people had suggested maybe they were used to help push them up. But really, you start putting the muscles on there, and those arms aren't reaching that much far beyond the chest. So um, yeah, maybe it could help, but uh, it's hard to say. Very weird. <laughs> yeah. I love just talking about weird dinosaur arms. They're one of my new favorite topics. <laughs> cool. And then, yeah, I guess we should mention T-Rex too. So I've, I recently saw a depiction of T-Rex claws that were just massive because we all know like there's a claw sheath, the keratin sheath that goes over the bone itself. So even though Tyrannosaur claws look relatively small, they might have still had some pretty sizable claws on them and then sort of an idea that if you got past the head you'd have these massive claws to contend with do you think that's kind of a reasonable idea i think it, it, it is reasonable to some degree and we're finding out well first of all a problem in the way that we have typically pictured tyrannosaurus claws stems from the fact that we haven't really had too many complete hands. Hmm. And so there's been a lot of guesstimation. In com For example, uh, as complete as the specimen is, Sue does not have a complete hand and does definitely does not have a complete thumb claw. There's the, the base of a claw that was associated with the skeleton they think is one of the thumb claws, but that's it. So the restored version for most of the specimens we've seen, they sort of duplicate the pointer finger claw for the thumb. But there have been now a couple newer specimens. Unfortunately, neither of them are adult. One is the, the PD specimen at the Burpee Museum. The other one is this specimen of, of dubious ownership at the moment. It's the mm. dueling dinosaur specimen. Oh, right. And if, in, in, that, in that case, it is also, there are people who argue it's not even Tyrannosaurus, but it is a Tyrannosaurid, unquestionably. Those two both have complete thumbs, and the thumb claw is huge. It is big and it's relatively flat from side to side. Uh, so in some ways, it's like a big dromaeosaur claw. Hmm. So it could be that they're, they were used for slasher claws. And given that the arms 
are proportionately bigger in younger individuals, it might be that the arms were more functional for a smaller individual, for like a Jane-sized or smaller individual. Maybe they're actually using those arms more in an active mode before their jaws are filled with railroad spikes. <laughs> And then as the skull gets proportionally bigger as they get older and it gets proportionally more reinforced, the arms become less and less useful in predation. So I think we're, we will be finding more and more that the ecology of dinosaurs went through substantial changes between hatching and adult size because they, so, they simply went through so much more changes in terms of size than, say, placental mammals do. Yeah. Nice. Do you also... I mean, since we're just talking about T-Rex now, do you have any thoughts about feathers on T-Rex? Oh, uh, yes. Well, I will say we do not yet have positive evidence for feathers on T-Rex. So that's true. We have scale impressions associated with T-Rex skeletons, and we have scale impressions associated with other tyrannosaurids. So we definitely know that they had scales, but this shouldn't be a surprise because there are zero feathered animals known that do not also have scales. <laughs> so those studies in which you say scale or feather are two options for the same organism, it's like, no, scale is one issue and they all had them. That's not a matter of debate, mm. except for a bit I'm going to get to in a, in a moment. Is the question is feathers or no? The problem is we have yet to find a tyrannosaurid preserved in an environment that is favorable to the preservation of fuzz, because it's only really rare, spectacular situations that preserve the sort of dino fuzz. And it is unlikely that they had fuzz in the same spots where we see the scales, but we can't disprove that because no one has yet shown what the fuzz would look like preserved in that three-dimensional imprint. So it could be that even those patches we're looking at had fuzz in between the scales and we're not seeing it because it doesn't preserve. Mm. If you have a net with a very big mesh and you go out to the sea and you start catching it and you say, there's only large fish, small fish don't exist. <laughs> uh, it's not that small fish don't exist, it's that the medium by which you're catching them can't catch the small stuff. So I would say those people are saying they dogmatically, that they definitely definitely did not have feathers. We don't have evidence for that yet. What we can say is they definitely had scales. The real complication is, or can we say that? <laughs> um, <laughs> because what we have are the impression of rough, lumpy objects on the body. And they could very well be scales that are homologous, that is, that represent the same evolutionary origin as the scales on turtles and lizards and crocodiles and so forth. Certainly a possibility. But there's recent work on the, um, the scalation on modern birds that suggests that those are not the ancestral scales of other reptiles that are just inherited by birds, that they're actually developmentally and evolutionary feathers that have been modified back into the shape of scales, which is really freaking weird. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And then there's the other possibility, because in some cases, like these scales on the face of some crocodilians, or even the um, sort of cracked, lumpy skin on the back of African elephants, in those two cases, neither of those are actually scales. Those are two examples of the same sort of thing, where very thick, keratinous, naked skin gets fractured during development, and it's intended to be fractured in development, and it produces the patterns that look like scales, even mm -hmm. though developmentally they're not their own specific developmental unit the way a scale is. And what we have for T-Rex and Albertosaurus and so forth are lumps in mud. So we can't really <laughs> tell if those lumps in mud are ancestral reptile scales or like birds were once fuzz secondarily derived into scales or were naked skin like the face of crocodilians that fractured into scale-like shapes. And unfortunately, the type of data that we would use to sort between them is histological tissue data. And we don't have the tissues there. All we have is the impression in the mud. So there's lithology, not histology there. So unfortunately, we can't really test from what we have, at least not at present, what the tissue type is for all of them. 
Gotcha. Interesting. So it makes it more complicated than people would like, but, you know, nature is what nature is. <laughs> and weird. <laughs> yeah, g given that earlier tyrannosauroids had a lot of fuzz over a lot of the body, it might be that what we're seeing on the patches on the body of T-Rex and Albertosaurus and so forth are these bird-like scalation, that it's secondarily derived from feathers. But unfortunately, we can't actually test for that at the moment. Yeah. Where do you think the best odds are in finding a specimen that would help? Because I, I can't think of any like late Cretaceous feathered finds. Right. There aren't too many of them. There are a couple ornithomimids from Canada. So there are some nice mudstones in environments where there are tyrannosaurids that have preserved this to some degree. Now, they're nowhere near as good as the preservation of the great Chinese and Russian and so forth lake deposits. Mm -hmm. But at least it's something. So maybe we'll find something there. Or maybe there are as yet unexplored lake deposits from the late Cretaceous of Asia or North America that could have something like the preservation we see in the Jehol group or the spot where we get Kalindodromius and so forth. <laughs> one, one good possibility is maybe somewhere in in Siberia, in eastern Siberia. Those places haven't been as explored as extensively as the American West or the Canadian West, but they're rocks of roughly the same age, and we're getting fossils from out of there. This is where things like Coronasaurus and uh, Zhucheng Tyrannus and so forth are from, from that region. So maybe we'll get some lake deposits there that are similar to the Yixiang and, and Shufutang and these other uh, Shahol group stuff that will show that. You know, fingers crossed. Who knows? Yeah. You know, it's sort of like at the other end of, of the Mesozoic. We don't have yet the equivalent formations with dinosaurs in them in the early part of dinosaur history. Because, you know, people would want to know, when, when did the fuzz show up in theropods? Is it just mm -hmm. Silurosaurs? Is it early, you know, did Coelophysoids have it? You know, were there any fuzzy sauropodomorphs in the Triassic, as weird as that might be? <laughs> It would be cool to find out, but we don't have the right lakes yet. Yeah. So I don't think I have any other questions about T-Rex. Did cover a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and didn't even mention you're very active on Twitter. Ah, yes. Yep. You know, happy to be part of the, you know, so the Twitter paleo community and the Facebook paleo community, which it was kind of strange. Some of, some of my students got me to get into that or in the early days, you know, I'm been an old timer on Facebook. I remember when you had to, in fact, when I started, you have to have an EDU account <laughs> so oh, yeah. to be on there. And now it's like the second largest nation on the planet. Only, <laughs> only China is bigger than Facebook. <laughs> and that may not even be true anymore. It may be bigger than China now. I don't even know. And then, you know, the Twitter verse is, is quite large. And that's, that, I'm sort of maxed out for social media now. I know that other forums exist, but I'm old and I can only handle two of these at a time. <laughs> Plus, I don't know how to take pictures of food very well. So <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. You get pictures of dinosaurs, even yeah, better. That's, exactly. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's cool to see the paleo cultures that have that are becoming part of that. That include, you know, both professional researchers and the amateur community, and then just you know fans. But they're not really part of any sort of organized fandom. They just want to check in once in a while and find out about dinosaurs and, and other prehistoric creatures. And it's fun to be able to interact with people that way and, and transfer knowledge in ways much more immediate than, um, than it might otherwise have been in the old days. And just like interesting little cultural things that start up, like Fossil Friday. Mm -hmm. You know, where everyone shares favorite pictures of fossils or things. Or sometimes we'll come up with themes and so that's always nice. And plus, occasionally, I'll see a really cool specimen. It's like, I can use this picture for a slide, you know, save. <laughs> well, we always follow your tweets during SVP, too. Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> Although, didn't you say this year you tweeted so many times that you got temporarily blocked? Yes. Uh, Meg Dickinson and I, and maybe someone else. <laughs> a couple of us. Yeah, there was so many tweets coming so quickly that some bot on Twitter said that they, they, they thought we must have been bots that we <laughs> stuff so quickly. And, and so they shut us down temporarily. Well, basically, we had to go through the process um, to confirm, yes, indeed, we are really who we are. We are human <laughs> beings. 
there really is that much stuff to talk about. <laughs> exactly. Yes. So but that's, you know, that's sort of a fun thing. You know, I started seeing other people doing live tweeting from conferences I wasn't at, and I thought that was a cool thing. And so now it's, it's become part of conference culture. And it's cool to, you know, be able to share things. And occasionally, if I act fast enough, to find what paper they're talking about or a related paper. And then so I can post the link to that as part of that hashtag so that people who are following along said, okay, I could check this out at some later point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely very helpful. <laughs> so Twitter is at Tom Holtz Paleo. Mm -hmm. And then where else? You mentioned Facebook. Is that another place to go for, for people who might want to learn more about you and your work? Yes. Yeah. You can find me. Um, you can follow me on. Facebook, uh, people do friend me and occasionally I will friend back, but <laughs> I've got lots and lots of friends there. And the unfortunate thing about uh, Facebook is as you start adding friends, it starts slowing down what you actually see. But people can follow me and I tend to make public posts. So so that's fine. And Twitter, yeah, at Tom Holtz Paleo, it's easy enough to find me and and find out, you know, what is new about, you know, dinosaurs and other fossil organisms. And I'll throw in climate change stuff and uh, fanish things and who knows whatever else strikes my fancy. So <laughs> awesome. Great. <laughs> well, thanks so much for taking the time to chat with us. Sure. Not a problem. Thanks again, Tom. We had a really great time and good luck with the dinosaur fight club coming up January 29th for anyone who's in Toronto. The Royal Ontario museum is having that event with Tom and Victoria Arbor to talk about the evolution of tyrannosaurs and armored dinosaurs, like Zool, which is on display. Yeah, I wish I could make it to that. I really want to see Zool. It sounds like an awesome specimen. Yeah, we've had a few listeners send us pictures, which has been really great. And now into our dinosaur of the day, Nanosaurus, which was a request from Allie, so thanks. It was an ornithischian that lived in the late Jurassic and what is now Colorado and also Wyoming, and it's often illustrated as a tiny dinosaur. There's not much known about it. It's mostly based on fossils that were later referred to Othniolosaurus, but it may have been between three and six and a half feet or one to two meters long. That's uncertain, but that's certainly not tiny. <laughs> <laughs> that's small compared to what people think of dinosaurs, but not really that small compared to a lot of the early dinosaurs. Yeah. Nanosaurus was an herbivore. It was described in 1877 by Othniel Charles Marsh, and Marsh named three species, Nanosaurus agilis, Nanosaurus victor, those two were named together, and then Nanosaurus rex, which he named later, but in the same year, 1877. Marsh also named the family Nanosauridae. Later, Nanosaurus became thought of as a Hypsilophodontid because it was small and somewhat looked like Hypsilophodon instead of Nanosauridae. The type species is Nanosaurus agilis, and the name means small or dwarf lizard. Supposedly, Marsh liked studying small dinosaurs from the Morrison Formation because Cope and his team had trouble finding them. <laughs> Oramo Lucas, a school attendant, found Nanosaurus agilis, the ilium, thigh bones, shin bones, fibula, and dentary impressions. Marsh's description of Nanosaurus agilis was very short. There were no illustrations or even information on the locality where it was found other than, quote, Mesozoic deposits of the Rocky Mountains. Oh, quote. man, that is vague. But that's kind of how it was during Bone Wars time. Mm -hmm. They Just didn't want to give rush. it up. Yeah, and to get it out as quickly as possible. He did say, though, that it was the, quote, most diminutive dinosaur yet discovered, end quote. It's possible that Marsh didn't describe the locality of Nanosaurus agilis because Aramo Lucas worked for Edward Drinker Cope. Supposedly, Marsh's assistant, Benjamin Mudge, visited Lucas, who wasn't too happy with Coke at the time, and Mudge convinced Lucas that his arrangement with Cope was only for large fossils, so yes, he could sell his small fossils to anyone, so he could sell Nanosaurus agilis to Marsh. And that sort of thing, I think, happened a lot in the Bone Wars as well, though that's one of the, more, the tamer stories. Yeah. Marsh illustrated some of the Nanosaurus agilis fossils around 1894-ish and then gave more descriptions, saying that it was very bird-like and, quote, about half as large as a domestic fowl, end quote. Nanosaurus victor was thought to be larger than Nanosaurus agilis, fox-sized versus half as large as domestic fowl or also <laughs> cat-sized. Nanosaurus rex was a little bigger than Nanosaurus agilis. I guess it depends on if you're including tails in these estimates, because if you're just going at length, then everything gets way bigger in your relations. True. But if you do it by weight or something, then, you know, it might be more like a cat. <laughs> That's very true. 
Marsh later renamed Dinosaurus Victor as Halipus Victor in 1881. And then in 1970, Alec Walker found that Halipus Victor was actually a small bipedal crocodilomorph, so not a dinosaur. Nanosaurus rex was known from a complete thigh bone. In 1973, Peter Galton and Jim Jensen described a partial skeleton as Nanosaurus rex. There was no head or hands or tail. And then in 1978, Peter Galton found that the rock with Nanosaurus agilis fossils had two right femora, which showed that there were two animals there. And he found that the smaller femur was Nanosaurus rex and the larger one was Nanosaurus agilis. Galton named a new family Fabrosauridae to include Nanosaurus agilis, which were primitive ornithischians. Galton made Nanosaurus rex the type species of the Hypsilophodontid genus, Othnelia, so then Nanosaurus rex became Othnelia rex, named in honor of Marsh. I've heard of that one before. Yeah, but not everyone agreed with the existence of Fabrosauridae. In 2007, Galton suggested that Nanosaurus agilis was possibly a basal ornithopod instead. So, to sum it all up, only Nanosaurus agilis is considered a valid species. Nanosaurus rex is now Othnelia rex, and Nanosaurus victor is now the crocodilomorph Halopus victor. Well, wow, they really got split up. Yep. And our fun fact of the day came from looking at maps of Cretaceous Europe. So basically, there's that Ibero Armorican island or islands, and much of Europe outside of that was underwater throughout the Mesozoic, especially in the Cretaceous, which means that we don't have as good of a fossil record there as we do from other places because marine sediments aren't the best place to find dinosaur fossils. Lakes are a lot better, for example. But there is another huge chunk of Europe that was an island during the Cretaceous. It's basically Scandinavia and Northwest Russia combined into this massive island. And they were out of the water for pretty much all of the Mesozoic, but unfortunately, the mountains there had already formed, and most of the rock is over a billion years old that's kind of on the surface now, including some areas that are like two or three billion years old. So we get very few dinosaurs from there, obviously, because all the little bit that got deposited from the Mesozoic has either washed away or was never really deposited there in any meaningful amount in the first place. So there's not a lot of dinosaur material to find in this big piece of land which was around while the dinosaurs were walking around on it, presumably. We do have a couple of dinosaur bones that were found in Mesozoic rock from southern Sweden, and we also have one Platyosaurus bone that was found over a mile deep off the coast of Norway by an oil drill. So obviously there's a little bit of Mesozoic rock kind of closer to the coastline. But unfortunately, since there's so little material from the Mesozoic, we probably won't ever learn too much about what was going on on this bigger island of Europe during the Mesozoic. Maybe we'll find some deposits somewhere. But unlike when you have newer sediment, you can always dig down and eventually get to the Mesozoic or, you know, over the course of millions of years, <laughs> it could wash away and you could find something. If you only have the rock that's a billion years old, if you dig, you just get two billion years old <laughs> and you'll you never get to the fossils in fact there aren't many fossils from this island in general because there wasn't a lot of stuff fossilizing a billion years ago there weren't vertebrates or anything so despite the number of dinosaurs that were probably on it sadly we won't know much about them well, that's too bad and on that note <laughs> that wraps up this episode of i know dino thanks for listening you should become a patron at patreon.com slash and that way you can listen to our full interview with Dr. Tom Holtz. We also just launched our Discord server so you can access that and help us reach the 110 patron mark. Then we can make some new pretty dinosaur-covered noise absorption panels. Hoo-hoo! <laughs> you can also follow us on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, all the social medias. <laughs> Don't forget to subscribe also so you don't miss out on any new episodes. Thanks for listening and until next time. Good